Yo, 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 we live on location. Me, the blackest one, we right here in Orlando, still staying our butts at home. But we got the AT&T towers keeping us connected, y'all. We got somebody very, very special. We got the, the, the first ever Naismith Hall of Fame inductee via the WNBA. We got greatness. We got Miss Raise the Roof, Cynthia Cooper. Four times, you said it four times, back to back to back to back champions. <laughs> Houston Comets, Cynthia Coop in the building. We appreciate you for pulling up. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. This is a, a great, great honor. You one of the legends. You one of the people that we grew up watching and rooting for and raising the roof. Brought to you by AT&T 5G. When you first made it to the WNBA, who's the first person to bust your ass? Nobody. Oh, so you were doing all the ass busting. Well, I ain't really play no defense. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That wasn't my role. You yeah, know what I'm right. Like, I never put myself in that situation. I'm trying to think of somebody who did, you know, but yeah, I can't really think because you know what? The truth be told, I was a container. That, you know, I contained the defense. I, I you know, I put a hand up. I contained, I boxed out, I got on a fast break. You know what I'm saying? They never put you on the real killers out there because that wasn't your job. You was the job, you used to be the assassin on the other end. So you had right, they, that energy. Right, they, they didn't want to give me in, in foul trouble. You know, those little little nuances. You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> I'm out there I'm out there trying to get it done. I'm going to the rim. I'm dragging people to the rim with me. <laughs> like they, man, they, I won't get me in foul trouble, you know? Right, Every right. once in a while, you know, I might have switched on, switched. <laughs> on to a, you know a top score, so you know that's one or two points. You know what right. I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. But you know, actually, maybe Cheryl Swoops and Tina Thompson in practice. Right. Like, oh, oh, look, can we go back to college? Oh yeah. Cheryl Miller, man. Cheryl Miller, she's a beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to go at it all the time. You know, she's the first chick I saw at her side handle that ball in the open court and lay that ball up up over the rim. And I was like, wow, shoot. She can play. Yeah. <laughs> so you you was born in Chicago. Yes. In LA. Stole. Wait, wait, time out, D-Mile. Don't just try and glaze over that. She was born <laughs> in the city of Chicago. City of Chicago. I love, I did not I know that. It. And I love that that I just found that out about you. I'm from born and raised in Chicago. So, you know, we we breed and raise greatness around. You know what I'm saying? It's in the water. <laughs> yeah. It's in the water. Yeah, yeah. I was I was born in Chicago. Um all my family, my, my grandparents, my aunts, cousins there in Maywood. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, and then I grew up in in, in Watts. You went to Lock High School. Mm hmm How was that? When uh, when you got to high school, was you you, you coming in as like you was you was the superstar and it, and it, it was coming, or was it when you got to high school? your sophomore or junior year, it started to click and then everything changed. Yeah, so I didn't really start playing basketball until my sophomore year in high school. Okay. So I, I ran track, I did some other sports, tennis, softball, um, but I started playing basketball late, you know, when I was in junior high school. So, you know, back in the day before y'all were born, junior high school finished in the ninth grade and high school started in the 10th grade. Cool, cool. Where I'm from, seventh through ninth was junior high, and ten through twelve was high school. Not well. Exactly high school was the last year to turn over. <laughs> yeah, he was. They were. They were way behind. They, they, they were, like I'm crazy. I'm like I played three years of high school. They like I didn't oh. know. It was foreign to me. I was looking at him right. like junior high. Like what you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we got elementary school, then high school. <laughs> That's exactly what I I I did. So I started playing the summer before my sophomore year. And it was great because, you know, I really love the game of basketball and basketball is just so complicated and, and fun and you never quite make it. So there's so much to learn. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't care because I didn't know much. So I had to learn everything. So there was no real fear of failure for me. So when I got to high school, my first year in high school, uh, we did okay. Um, yeah. My junior year, we made it to the city finals and we lost. And then my senior year, we won a championship, uh, won not only the city championship, but the state championship. Um, and yeah, I'd only been playing three years and I averaged 31 points. 
Don't ask me how many defensive stops I got though. <laughs> hey, but look, but look though, at that point when you averaging 31, you you the city and state champions, that means everybody coming is calling and looking for you and they know what's going on now. How was that to come from as a as a sophomore just starting to pick up the game to to two years later, you you are you a state state city and state champion and player of the year. So oddly enough, I didn't get highly recruited. I had one scholarship offer from USC and I took what? it. How does that happen? Well, you know, I was a late bloomer. I started playing late. We were poor, so I didn't have any money to go play AAU or okay. go travel around or go to anybody's basketball camps or Blue Star or this. I didn't have any right. money to do that. I was in inner city. I played in the Watt summer games. So I really didn't have much visibility. And the only time USC saw me is when we went up north, Northern California, to play in the state tournament. Uh, so that's when they saw me. So, you know, I I was a late bloomer, but uh, I came around. They found a diamond <laughs> in the rough. I think so. Who instilled the, the game in you? Like, who instilled the scoring in you? Because you scoring, you scoring 30 in high school. So somebody must have told, like, came to you was like, this is, this is how you play this game and, and you got to be so fierce in scoring because ever since I've seen you play, you always got buckets. Like, who was that that put that in you to, like, I got to be a killer at all times? Well, I will say the person who taught me how to play basketball, Lucius Franklin. And Lucius, he threatened me a lot, you know? If you don't, <laughs> if you don't, you know, if you don't show up on time, I'm going to stop coaching you. If you don't do this, I'm going to stop coaching you, you know? And so if you ever complain, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to stop coaching you, but I would, I would say guys instilled in me that killer instinct that you can't make a mistake. You got to You got to finish. You mm -hmm. got to finish through contact. You can't, um, you got to come out and be ready to play every time you step on the court. And because when back in the day, guys didn't, wouldn't let girls play with them. Yeah. So I couldn't even come in the gym and call a game. I had to get my brother to call a game and then select me on his team. Mm. Once I started playing and I proved myself, you know, guys, they, they, you know, they rallied around me. They, yeah. I walked in the gym, y'all got cool. Like, you know, it, it eventually got to that. But at the end of the day, when you play with guys, they don't accept mistakes from women. Yeah. From girls playing with guys, they don't expect mistakes. They won't, they won't tolerate them. You miss a shot, yo, this is a man's game. You ain't supposed to be out here anyway. Yeah. You, know, you miss a pass, yo, you ain't got that, you know, kick it to me. I'm better than you, quote, yeah. pretty much. So they instilled the, the, the mentality of scoring, the mentality of, of finishing, like finishing around the rim, and the mentality of being, being creative when you go to the basket because they're constantly trying to block your shot, hold mm. you, push you, foul you, be physical with you. And so for me, I... When they let me play with girls, I was like, yes, that's what you're talking about. I know when I came up, I, I, I played with older guys and they used to be on me like that, but it, it helped me not to make as many mistakes as the, yeah. usually the people that was my age. Did it help you not make the mistakes playing with the guys? And when you got with the girls, it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was even more easy. That's exactly right. I mean, guys were relentless. Like they won being very physical. And, and you couldn't make mistakes and stay on the court and play with guys. Yeah. First of all, in L.A., you right. grew up in the inner city, like you have, you're on the blacktop, right? You, you, in, you in the city. Like you, you get off the court, you might not get on for another hour. Exactly. Right? And guys do not play with that. Like they be like, look, <laughs> we need to stay on this court, you know? And so for me, it did help me um, play and not make mistakes while I played. And it also helped me when I took a shot, I didn't just shoot shots because I was open. I shot back, I shot the ball because I knew I could make it. I shot it when I could make it. I penetrated when I could get to the basket. And so it, playing with guys helped me be a better decision maker and then helped me finish, whether it was finishing my passes or finishing my shots. When you came up playing, like uh, who's that, that, that woman that you've seen that you was like, man, I want to be like her. I know, I know it was men that you actually was looking at, but I know like who's the woman that you seen that was before you and you was like, man, I want to kind of be like that or, or seen a couple of moves off that person. Like I want my game, I want to add that to my game. Yeah, I'll say Lynette Woodard. 
Lynette Woodard, first female basketball player to play for the Harlem Globetrotters. Okay. And yeah, she was incredible. She's the first female that I saw that was that athletic and can handle the ball. And I felt like her game was as close to complete as possible. So I wanted to have a complete game. I didn't want someone to write on the scouting report, send her this way or send her that way. She can't do mm. this. She can't do that. I wanted to have a complete game. I want my scouting, my side to be one page long. This like is just the purest. Do you hear this? This is a purist you talking about over here. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I grew up with the, the Magic Johnsons and the, you know, Norm Nixons and the Jamal Wilkes and, you know, Showtime, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I grew up with, I, I remember, I do remember this, Penny Hardaway. Let me tell you what Penny did. Penny came down on the fast break on the left side of the floor. There was a defender there. He faked like he was going back out and reverse dribble and dunk that ball. Man, I use that move so much, you don't even know. People were lost. They thought I was taking the ball back out. I turned back around, boom. I laid it up though. I'm just throwing that out there. I ain't had those hops, right? But I learned from everybody I saw play the game and then the things that applied to my game that could help my game, I added them. Let me ask you this. I know, I know USC was the only one, but was when everybody kind of noticed you late, was there anybody that almost snuck in there and just like stole you from USC? Like I said, I'm from an inner city. So I'm one thing about me is I'm fiercely loyal. Okay. And I understood that academics was going to get me further in life and get me out of the inner city. So I was very loyal to a USC family that helped me further my education through sports. Right. So I listen. My first year, we had the McGee twins, you know, so they, they from Flint, Michigan, you know, right. one Hollywood, one is a little more, you know, and, and then Cheryl Miller came the year after. So I was like, let's get this. So we yeah. made it to the championship game in the NCAA, three out of my four years, Elite Eight my first year, and two championships out of there. So I was in the right place. <laughs> Tell me how that was when you got there. Like you said, somebody is coming from the inner city, you know what I'm saying? It's a, 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 a tough situation as far as home, you know what I'm saying, where you grow up, but like going to, like you said, a prestigious university like USC and you get there and now you 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 in this spotlight because like you say, y'all were good. Y'all winning championships and y'all being noticed. Like how, how was that for you? Now you're not really flying under that radar anymore. Right, so I had two problems. One, I. I was in the inner city all my life. Mm -hmm. So going to a private university like USC, I mean, with all the money there and all of the, I had never seen so many rich white people in my life. <laughs> right. I'd only seen them on television. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that was a huge adjust adjustment for me. Culture shock, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was a huge culture shock. Um, but I had great teammates and Tracy Longo was my, she came in the freshman year with me and she took me to my first rock concert. <laughs> um, so, so she helped me get adjusted really, uh, really well. But at, as far as basketball goes, you know, the second problem was, you know, I was, was always energetic. I was always trying to learn. I'm always trying to get better. And I just came off a state championship. I want to start. I only understood playing, practicing, working to start and be a star and be great. That's all yeah. I understood. So when, when my role was to come off the bench, that was another adjustment for me. Yeah. You know, it's finally Coach Sharp, she pulled me to the side. She's like, look, 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 look at the stat sheet. You played 34 minutes. Whether you started or not in an important moment of the game, you're in. Yeah. So what, what you complaining about again? <laughs> I was like, you're right, Coach. You're right, though. I still should be starting, though. <laughs> <laughs> so to be a part of a, a, a tandem like that, uh, probably the I don't, ain't probably the best tandem in history, you and Cheryl Miller in college. Like, how was that when you look back on it and, and you see in the history now? Because, like, you know, the game is evolving now. You see see these girls now in college and so forth on. But you was in college, and it, it wasn't no, no WNBA after college. It's great. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal to be able to come to practice and know you're going to get challenged every single day to know that you're going to be challenged, be put in a situation where you can get better every single game, every single day, because Cheryl Miller was that type of player. The McGee twins were those types of players that if you came and you didn't bring your A game, 
you were going down. You was going to have a terrible practice because they were bringing their A game to every practice. And yeah. Cheryl Miller was a hard worker. Now, she did play defense. So, <laughs> you know, remember, I'm the sixth man. So, I'm not in the starting class. So, we're scrimmaging every day against each other. Yeah. And that's how I was able to get better because I played against the best. Yeah. So tell me this after after college, you know, like like D said, it wasn't it wasn't a WNBA there. So so where did your journey lead you immediately after your four years of college? Yeah, so I wanted to pursue my dream of playing professional basketball, and they told me the only place that we can play professional is overseas. So I went and took a job in in Spain in Valencia in a small city called Batara, and so I averaged forty five points there my first Ooh. year over there. Yeah, man, I, I was coming into my own a little bit. A little nah, bit. that's a that's a walking bucket right there. Yeah, Forty five yeah. points. That's fall out of yeah, bed was, into buckets. I was, I was, I was. I had a good year. Um, that is really what sparked the interest of everyone overseas. Um, so I only I, I went over there for like twenty thousand dollars. The next year they recruited me to come to uh, Italy. So I played in Italy the next ten seasons. Uh, wow. Ten years and so you're part of italiano so check out con que para italiano porque oh you speaking it fluently huh italiano sí sí porque yo cato lipe 10 años lo veo hablar la lengua that's all the time out that's the first for the knucklehead podcast we even had a couple of oh. here and switch it up one time <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I learned italian while i was over there uh played in a city called parma parmigiano reggiano the parmesan cheese prosciutto di parma that city and then um, I played two more years in Alcamo, which is in Sicily. You sound like you got like unbelievably cultured, like you speaking it fluently. Like how was that to spend? I mean, I, I've always, I've been to Italy once um, just on some Nike trip stuff. Didn't really get to go kick it and hang out, but I saw it's amazingly beautiful. Like how was that for you to spend, you know, like you said, coming from the inner city and here you are after school, somebody that was a, from a poor neighborhood, you living in this beautiful city, you got the little orange basketball that did take you all the way across to this wonderful city and you living a life over there and you a star. Yeah, you know, I have a basketball shirt, a Nike basketball shirt that says, basketball saved my life. Yes. It really should say basketball <laughs> allowed me experiences that I would have never had coming yeah. from the inner city and Watts and traveling all over Europe, not just in Italy, because, you know, it was a culture shock. I didn't speak the language. I was in a small city. Very few people spoke English. And so I had to learn the language. But yeah. I lived as an Italian. I learned the Italian culture. I traveled around and went to Florence or uh, Venezia or Roma. I went down to Sicily, Napoli, where the best pieces in the absolute world, up to Milano. Would you agree? I feel like that 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 some of the movie Love and Basketball ripped some of your life. It, 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 <laughs> you I'm know, just saying, I, I just I, didn't for get some reason, stuff. yeah, for some reason, I see like, like when you saying I can see you, 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 you saying you didn't yeah, speak yeah. the language. I can see you getting yourself ready. You're like they like you like what they say. He's <laughs> like give you the ball because you <laughs> average your 45. Like you know what I'm saying? Like My you don't even know what's going yeah. on. But it's I'm like yo yo yo. Pass. That's the first thing I learned. <laughs> How do you say pass? Pasa la palla. Pasa la palla. <laughs> that and my money. I wanted to know where my money was coming from, and I wanted to know if you were going to pass me the ball. Those were the two, the first two things I learned. So, no, it was great to learn the Italian culture. It was great. See, see, I was set up for success by my time at USC because USC taught me that I could do anything I want. I could learn. I could travel. And I was okay. I was okay being who I was, a kid from the inner city. I was okay in my own skin. USC taught me and gave me that type of, that level of confidence. When I went overseas, I was about proving. I had to prove that I was a go-to player. I had to prove that I could live in another country and still excel. I had to prove that I could set myself apart when they're double teaming me, being physical with me. I could still finish. But remember, I learned most of that from the guys I played with growing up. Right. So I held myself to a higher standard my first couple of years overseas. And that helped me to build a brand and build my kind of build my legacy overseas. I love that you saying that these young athletes and, and, and players need to hear that, especially the ones that, you know, that are that are spotlighted. You know how they are these days. They get spotlighted so young and become stars at a young age and have social media followers. They need to hear people like you say things like that, that you held yourself to a different standard. Right. Too many of us get 
a little bit of stardom and get content. Like I ain't got nothing else to prove I'm here. Like, dude, as long as you who you are, you supposed to continue proving yourself and trying to recreate and get better That's until right. you walk out the door. You supposed to, you supposed to become every better day. every single day. Yes, every day. Every day. How was it to, I know you go overseas now and, and, and you're not really playing ball in the United States, but you get selected for the USA team. Man, that was, that was so great. So I had put together a whole resume. I put together game film, some stats. Yeah. I knew the league was coming, but I didn't know they were going to select me. So I put together all of this stuff and I sent it off to, I was going to send it off to the WNBA, Renee Brown. And then I was like, you know what? I should probably sh shoot a call over there. I should probably call her first, let her know the package is coming. So I called over there. I, find, I get Renee's number. I call her. I said, yeah, this is Cynthia Cooper. I'm playing in Italy. You know, I, hey, I would love to play in the WNBA. I put together this packet for you guys with some video, et cetera, et cetera. And she was like, Cynthia Cooper from Parma in Italy? We've been looking for your address. We've been looking for you. Mm. You're, you're part of our top eight. I was like, yes. But on the phone, I was like, yes, man. <laughs> I was like, yes. I called my mother. <laughs> I went, oh, you have a plan at WBA. She was like, where? I was like, come and play. They want me to play. I said, they, I said I'm in their top eight. I'm in their top eight. <laughs> and it was so dope. And then they put me in Houston. What the WNBA didn't know at the time, I was already living in Houston. Mm. I already had a house there. That's what's so up. They were like, oh, we got to find your place to stay. I was like, I stay in Sugarland. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually, it, it was written already. It was supposed to happen. And so I was over the moon at the opportunity to play in America in front of American fans, in front of my friends and my family that I lost touch with. They didn't know what I was doing because I had been in Italy for 10 years. That's crazy to hear that you, that you made those phone calls and you put the package together and you were doing that like not an agent and not somebody, you know what I'm saying? It just shows you the difference in times and how it was back then. Like for you to be having to, you know, make those calls and do that leg work yourself, that's, mm -hmm. that's crazy. I mean, you do get the fruits of getting that call and receiving that information yourself though. You are in charge of your own future. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is in charge of your future except you. You need to be willing to put in the work, to be humble, to go and let people know what you want. Let yeah. people know what's mm -hmm. next for you. And then you pave that way. You you start laying down the foundation for, for that path. Yeah, I tell you, young kid, the first thing you got to do is get off your ass. <laughs> That's right. You get off your ass and move and do so because ain't nobody going to do it for you, you know? Right. And kids these days, they they have two problems. They ain't willing to work for it. And then they're afraid to fail. Stop yeah. being afraid to make a mistake. Stop being afraid for somebody to catch you on some video and you, you're not at your best. So what? Who mm -hmm. cares? You're supposed to fail to be great. You're supposed to fail to get better. You cannot get better if you're afraid of trying because you might not be good at it. You you get good at it because you continue to practice on it. There you go. <laughs> you, know, you work at it. That's why. You get to the USA team. How was that when you coming from, from Palmer where you are and you getting selected to represent the USA with the most elite women from the U from the, from the United States? The real dream team. Y'all been kicking ass. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I will tell you that once again was a, a, a path that I didn't know I was I was gonna take, right? So I my first experience with the with the USA basketball was in the um, the World Championships in 86. I know you guys were, were too young. Um, but in with the World Championships, right? And I actually went to an open tryout. Mm. Yeah, man. I didn't mm. get invited. Wow. You know, it's just like the kid from that only had one scholarship offer. Right. So I, I did an open tryout with everyone else, 200 people, right? So we, we two days in. Then the invited group came in. Now, have I mentioned that I'm an assassin? Yes. That I don't play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play. I got this laser, this zoom focus that I'd be like, okay, who's the two guards? Where are the two guards? Anybody on the wing, point guard. Wait, I want, hey, look, I put them all down. You know why? Because I need to make this team. Like it never dawned on me that I wasn't supposed to make that team. Yeah. So I made the team and that started my USA basketball career, right? And then playing with some of the greatest players ever, once again, for me, I always felt like I had to prove myself. That breeded hard work, you know, so I would, I'd come to work every single day. 
I'm coming at you every day because first I want to make the team. Then I want to start on the team. Well, I want to play on the team and then I want to start. So I'm constantly looking for ways to get better and better and really outdo you because you're in my position and you need to go down. And that's the part people don't want to be honest about sometimes. That's right. the part that people don't want to be honest about sometimes. Hey, all that nice guy stuff. I remember, d you remember this, what I'm about to say to you. Our, it was it our rookie or second year in the league? Our rookie or second year in the league? I, t- I was, it, it, whether it was true or not, this was my mentality. We going into training camp, you know, we all tight. We were all 19 and 20 and like, LO is our big homie. He like our big bro and we love him to death. Me, Keon, Corey, we were a tight group. Me and D-Miles be together. I'm like, yo, D, you got to tell the little LO ass up this training camp. Right. You got to tell his ass up and let him know what it is. This is what I'm telling him. The whole summer when we working out and everything, he like, come on, man, it's LO. I'm like, you got to tear his ass up and let him know <laughs> what it is. Like, for real. Was, was I not telling you that the whole time? I love LO so much that I couldn't yeah. talk to him and bust his ass. I just had to bust his ass. Well, I had a teammate, uh, Kim Parat. She ended up passing away from, from cancer. Rest in peace, Kim. Um, we almost fought in practice. Mm. I don't play no games. I'm coming after you every day. Coach, Coach Chancellor used to get mad at me because I came to the first day of every training camp. Every training camp. Because the right wing is taken. You got to go somewhere else to get some playing time. <laughs> it's mine. Straight up. Straight up. And I'm giving it to him every day. I'm in yeah. there. I'm in there before them, so I'm doing my weight workouts with, with with the trainer. I'm doing my sprint workouts on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'm already drenched before they even get in the building, and then mm. I go at them, and then I take the rookies after practice and work on my one on one game because you know I'm a container <laughs> you defensive. Don't see it. You don't see it. <laughs> That's why I'm crazy. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Hey, you get to the comments and you see your squad. Cheryl Swoops, Tina Thompson, number one pick. You know what I'm saying? Then you got Kemper Rock, the ones that people really don't know about. You know what I'm saying? To add to the mix. To see y'all squad and, you know, you looking at it and, and you know, they, they putting Lisa Leslie and the Sparks and, and putting New York and Teresa Weatherspoon as like, oh, them the, them the people who are going to be the champions. And then y'all come with that three-head monster and it's just, man, y'all just run them off right away. Like you, did, you feel, did you feel like when you seen them and y'all kind of clicked, did you feel like, like, oh shit, they fucked up letting us be all be on the same squad? Yeah. <laughs> so when I first, when first we, we selected Tina, so I knew Cheryl was pregnant, right? But I didn't know what type of player Tina Thompson was, right? So I'd seen some film on her, I'd heard about her, but I didn't know what type of player she was. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She can shoot the three? <laughs> <laughs> she don't have to roll? <laughs> I was like, she don't have to roll and clog up the lane for my <laughs> penetration. What? It's the one that popping. It's a wrap. <laughs> it, it is a wrap. And, and, you know, so initially we played without Cheryl because she was having little Jordan at the time. But when all three of us got together, so everybody, no one believed that we could all play together. Yeah. But what they didn't understand was I was a 34-year-old rookie. That was what I was about to say. Yeah. Yeah. Tina was coming out of college. Right, so she has still some, 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 some things to learn, and she needed a veteran to help, you know, navigate those waters in her first couple years. And then Cheryl was coming off of a pregnancy, so I was the man. Yeah. Like I needed, I needed to step up. Yeah. But that's okay, cause I was gonna do that anyway, cause <laughs> I spent all that time overseas, and yeah. I was happy to be home. So let me paint the picture for you. We, me as a young kid, I'm, I'm in all in the sports, all in the basketball. So for me, it was like you came out of nowhere. Like you said, you expecting everybody talking about, you know, we, we all are, we know about Cheryl Swoops, and, and she had the, for me, for us, she had a Jordan deal. So we like, yeah, Cheryl Swoops, but you know all of this. And then it was like Cynthia Cooper raising the. We all like, yo, who is this coming getting straight buckets like? Buckets, and then you was hyped, you was animated, you was like, you was a fan. It was like, this was like, she kind of came out of nowhere. (laughs) Yeah. 34 year old rookie, like 34. Boogie. Because you know, giving giving buckets. You know why? Because that's all I do. Yeah. Right. So when I came in the league, I'm like, look, this is no pressure. They they, They don't know about me. They don't know what I've been doing. They don't know how I've been working on my game. 
They don't know how, what, what, how I've been uh, conforming a game that's complete. They don't know the hard work that I put into my game every day, yeah. right? They don't know my mentality of coming to practice and, and working hard and going hard every single day in practice. They don't know that. All they know is Rebecca Lobo, Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie, and, and Teresa Weatherspoon. All yeah. right, cool. No problem. So once again, I have something to prove. Right, I have a chip on my shoulder because I there are a couple players that are that are played overseas that I saw I, I played against overseas. They knew me, but nobody knew what how I would play and be able to excel in the WNBA. Yeah. I did though, especially when I saw that Tina could pop and shoot the three. When Cheryl is a is is a spot up shooter and she penetrates on the on the wing and she does play defense, yeah. right and Tina has this tough mentality. That's why she's a Hall of Famer, mm -hmm. right? Because she can not only play with her back to the basket, she can stretch out and shoot the three, and she just smooth. Yeah. <laughs> she just don't care, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we had that team, and I was like, all right, you know, I'm the veteran of this team, and I know how to play my position, play my role so that we can be great. We can win championships. I love how y'all ran it off. When you won that first one, that first one after you'd have been overseas, you know, did all that stuff, and you got that first WNBA championship in the United States, the the women's league. Like, how was that? Like, I know that was like so surreal. Like, it, it felt like everything was worth it. It really did. It was so, it was so phenomenal. Like the day before, uh, we were we were practicing, and after practice, you know, Kim Parrot, very good friend of mine, she she was nervous. She's so nervous. And she, I was like, yo, Kim, why are you so nervous? She was like, I've never won a championship before. I said, you're going to win one tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. I got you. Like, I got you. Because that's what teammates do. And that's a motivation that you, that, that to play for a teammate, to win a championship with a teammate and for a teammate, that takes the cake. That, that's, that's everybody's dream. It should be. Um, but for, for us to win the first championship was amazing. Like it was, it, like you said, it, I had come from overseas and I thought about it all. You know, my friends from Italy were texting me and they were like, yo, you did it. You did it. You're killing. My mom was still alive. So she got a chance to see us win our first two championships. And we went home and watched the, we watched the highlights on ESPN, you know, while everybody's partying. I'm watching the highlights with my mom at home. That's awesome. Uh, it was just, it was just an amazing, magical season, and and that championship, man, first ever. Because you know, we'll always be. Yeah. The first ever. It can always. only be one. Yes. Always. Yeah. Always, and they ain't running them off. How y'all was running them off? Like, That's what I'm saying. Like you, y'all came in. I was like, how did they let this team get together? Like, how did they let this team get together? Once you really saw how good y'all were, and they ran off like four, like that many in a row, you running off consecutive scoring titles, MVPs. Like, how 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 was that? Like, it was like they they the best team in Houston. Like they got they went in all the chips. They 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 they, they got H Town on lock. How was that? It was amazing. I mean, I had never had that type of notoriety, no, notoriety and, you know, just exposure overseas. And so I'm walking down the streets in New York and they're like, yo, cool. <laughs> Man, you got a game. Now, if they say it in New York, it must be true. You're right. <laughs> I just, it was absolutely amazing for me to experience that. But I will tell you the reason why we were able to win championship after championship is because we were never the same the next year like we were the first year. We were never the same. We always added to our game. We always added some body, some person, or some, some uh, move or game or energy. Like we, we had, um, I think it was our second year. Might have been our third year, but no, it was our second year. We had the highest winning percentage of any professional team ever. 90%. And it's because we hey. we beat teams when we walked in the gym. We <laughs> they were walked, scared already. <laughs> we walked in the gym like, man, I remember one player, Sue Wicks, I was walking off the, the practice court. We had a shoot around. I was walking off and she said, really cool? I was like, what? She said, so you, you're never going to come into training camp out of shape? 
Never. A little overweight, nothing. You just gonna be ready? Yeah, man. I'm gonna be Damn ready right. every day. <laughs> what greatness do. That's what greatness is right here. Yeah. A lot of people put us part of the culture because we came up with a, a celebration. You know, we was happy to be here. Like we wanted to, our celebration was part of like, nah, we finna show y'all as young guys right. in the grown man league that we up in here. Your celebration is one of my favorite celebrations. Like, like everybody was raising the roof. Where did you get that from? And what made you start doing that? Well, I actually got it from Kim because she was the cool person on our team. <laughs> and so she had all the cool stuff. So I kind of cherry picked it from, from Kim. <laughs> um, but I tell you, you know what was great about Raise the Roof is that it just got so loud in there. I'm like, Raise the Roof. And then you look around and everybody's raising the roof and they into it. It makes you want it more and more and more. <laughs> Every game. And if you don't do it, they gonna get on your ass and be like, They're hold looking on. looking at me like, what are you doing? And, and <laughs> you not listen, feeling well? Listen, What's wrong with you? Quiet, oh. is, quiet is kept. That is literally part of why we continue to do, do it. Because we was like, they got to raise the roof. Like back then it was NBA Live. They had it on a video game. You score, you go back. We like, me and D-Mal like, look, the least we could do, we could try to get this thing on a video game. We do this enough, they might put it on the game. And I promise right. you, that was part of the reason why we were doing it. And then when it got on the game, we was like, we made it. We made it on a video game. Like we just like to raise the roof, I promise. That's hilarious. And, and it was also a way of getting the fans engaged with what we were doing and experiencing what we were experiencing on that court. So let's bring this, let's bring this together. Let's bring, you guys are coming supporting us every single game and during championships. And if we lost a game, you're supporting us. Let's let's bridge that gap. Let's make you a part of this. And man, when I, I did this, man, oh my God, 16,000 fans just yelling and screaming. I remember I was at the free throw line. It was, uh, it was the first year. I'm at the free throw line. It's late in the season. I'm at the free throw line in the compact center. That's when we played in the compact center and I'm shooting a free throw. And all of a sudden, I hear MVP, MVP. You know, I'm a girl. I start to cry. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about me. <laughs> Yo, you deserve it. You deserve it. it when you fuck up. Like, I, I used to just love that, just love seeing it. The commercials, seeing it, just the ponytail, the, 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 the ponytail and the. <laughs> And the race, like, but if you think about it, that like that's inspired just, a movie because just like how you know you go look around when that happened, we was in high school. We was in high school. We mm -hmm. we, we banging on people, running back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I like I can't yeah. tell you who started it, who originated, but I know you was one of the main people where I got it from. Where I was running yeah, around talking about it. that's hard. We gonna raise. <laughs> hey, you gotta. Hey, you gotta put that in. If you do something to somebody, you gotta. You, you know what I'm saying? Hey so, man, you got to man. Look exactly. It was a great period of time in the WNBA where we just really had an opportunity, a unique opportunity to lay the groundwork and the foundation for what was to come for the next generation, for the kids that were now dreaming of being Cheryl Swoops, Tina Thompson. And so now you have the Diana Taurasi's, you know, the Sue Bird's, you have, you know, uh, just everyone's coming, Maya Moore's and Everyone's playing at such a level and the talent is such a level that it's, it's just amazing. And I look back, I'm in, in, in pride. I know Enrique, she, she broke my record, right, for, for scoring. And I was like, boom, here's the torch, baby. It's yours. Mm -hmm. You got this. Yes. Like when I did it, I wanted to do it at my best and be the best. And now you're doing this. Now, yeah. now carry it. Carry that torch. Straight up. Like, you know, to do it, you know, in this league and when you at the highest league, you get some type of criticism for it. Some coaches didn't like it, some players didn't like it. And I know as women, one of the main things that people be trying to say when they play in sports is that they can't be that emotional. They can't show that much excitement or they can't, you know, do like the fellow. They can't show that. Did you have people trying to say like, oh, you can't be that way? You know, the WNBA, I think was so new and everyone was trying to figure out who we were gonna be and what it was gonna be like. I didn't get any type of backlash from it. I, I really didn't. Um, as a matter of fact, like, like I would ride out the tunnel in my car 
and the fans would be over there raising the roof. Yeah, yeah. Like just, just raising the roof. And, uh, and so it was endearing to me that everyone kind of tied on to, grabbed on to it and held on to it tight because it showed that I was making a difference, right? That I was, I was creating a platform for the next generation to, to really uh, showcase their talent, you know? So for me, it, I never really got backlash. You know, I, I'm, I'm super aggressive, right? So I'm super aggressive. I, I am a go-getter because, you know, uh, you guys know this. When you grow up in the inner city, you don't, a lot of times you don't get a second chance. You yeah. got to get that, you got to get it right the first time, mm -hmm. right? You don't get a do-over, you know, whether it be, whether you're denying, you don't want to take the drugs or you don't want to join the gang or, you know, the walk, the long walk from the bus stop back right. to the house. It, one you know, decision uh, be right for death. One decision for right. Definitely. One decision. So you right? got. So, yeah. Yeah, you you feel me, right? Yeah. So for me, I may always try to make that one decision count. Yeah. You know, I, I make it worth it, you know, and then accept my responsibility. I didn't always make the right decision, but I thought it was the right decision. So I'm going to accept that I was wrong, and I'm gonna do better next time. Tell me this: You talked about how you always would feel like you always got something to prove, and and, and you want to continue to to get better. Tell me how difficult that could be when you win in four in a row. Cause I think people get complacent with success and you clearly aren't that type of person and you didn't do that. So I, I think for me, I always have something to prove even when we won a championship. So, you know, after the first year, you know, the influx of the ABL players came in. So everybody was telling, oh, there's no way they can do it again. And Cheryl, Mil Cheryl Swoops is coming back. So now Cheryl Swoops coming back, there ain't enough balls for them. So we had to prove that. You know, a third year, Kim was sick. And my mom had died. So it was three for 10. And that was kind of a motivation. But I'm going to just say this real quick. You know, I want to be great every day. I don't want to be great on Sunday, on Wednesday, and on Friday. I want to be great every time you see me. Because I don't know if that's going to be the only time you see me. So I want to show out for you that day so that you understand that that's what you should do every day. And that was just my motivation. And so to win back-to-back -back championships four times, um, to win to win back-to-back -to -back, to -back, back championships, um, it was just a mentality. Humble it's a brag. mentality to want to win every day and to want to show every day and to want to be better every game and to want to, be, to win a championship every year. So, so I don't get tired of winning. Yeah. That's the one thing about me. You know, I don't get complacent because I don't get tired of winning. And I said this earlier that I, when I went, went overseas, I held myself to another standard, to a different level. And I did that same thing in the, in the WNBA because by this time, I'm 37. I'm 38. And set you know, the bar. You set the bar. And, I, <laughs> like and so now bar. I really got to work, right? right? So, you know, I'm, it's not as easy to get in shape. It's not as yeah. easy to maintain muscle and this, that, and the other. So... I right, shoot, let's go. Like, like I'm, I'm in the gym, I'm practicing, I'm working out. Hard work has never been a stranger to me. Yeah. You know, from growing up in the inner city, from going overseas, it, it's never been something that, that was foreign to me. You know, I'm ready to play. And, and remember now, when you play with guys, they running up and down that court fast and dynamic and they jumping and they, they, they physical. You got to match their energy. I wanted to ask you about uh, Kim Parrott. I know she was like a like a heart and soul, and I remember uh, Tina Thompson talking about just that season that 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 y'all have her, and she was sick. Uh, can you speak about Kim Parada and what she meant to that comments team? Because she won one of the bigger names, but it seemed like she meant so much to all of y'all. Yeah. So Kim was our floor general, but she was our leader on and off the court. And you know, when you talk about the soul of a team, you talk about someone that can be the glue one day that can keep the superstars in their place, in their lane, and then at the same time, bring them out on the court to still perform at their best. And Kim was a magician as far as that goes. And she just was genuine. She was genuine. You know, Kim used to score. She went to, um, she was a raging Cajun at, at Louisiana Lafayette. And yeah. she came from a scoring background, but she put her game to the side so that she could mesh with us and we could win a championship. And that just goes to her character and, and her spirit. And I just remember Kim, first of all, we were very close. And I just remember Kim never ever letting point guards bring the ball up the court. 
she would just hawk the ball, like mm -hmm. make a post player, bring it up, make a post player, bring it up, girl. And <laughs> that, you know, it was so funny because I was, I think I was the second leading, um, I was the second leader in steals on the team because she would pressure the point guard so much, she would deflect the ball, I would get the steal. I'm just saying, I was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Kim was amazing. You know, she was amazing. She was, she's the only person that told me off on the court. Like I was on, I shot the ball two times. She was like, yo, Coop, you could have passed that. Like, I ain't gonna pass right. it to you again if you don't, like you, you got passed. Shoulders over there. Right. And, and I was like, who you talk, talking to you? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm gonna pass the next one. Right. Um, <laughs> but she just kept us together. She kept us in line. And when it was time for her to knock down shots and finish around the rim and steal the ball, and she would always pick up that intensity and get us going. We had Tina on the show and we was talking about the shot that- uh, Yeah, that I saw that. Weatherspoon. Uh, <laughs> she said, you ain't see, you ain't see. You said, yeah, yeah, I saw that. You ain't, you ain't catch yeah. that right there. <laughs> It's like, you ain't got to bring it up right now, Vince. I know it's so much winning it. And like, I just remember when I was just young and, and I came down with the screen and roll with Tina and and, and it was like, oh yeah, it's over. This this is the death blow. It's nothing that they can do. This this, this one, this one four screen and roll, this two, this two, four screen and roll, it's over with. And she hit that shot. How did you feel when she hit the shot and y'all thought it was actually over? So you should have heard the silence in that building. Man, that silence was so loud. So I was actually under the basket, under the their basket. So I saw the ball coming and I'm like, that looked like it's good. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, you, you guys are ballers. You, yeah. you know when, yeah, when that ball is coming, you're like, that looked like that's some wet. Right. That thing went in, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, me, ever the optimistic, I'm so optimistic, right? So I'm walking, I get to half court. I see the, the officials are lined up at the at half court. So I, 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 I'm over there, I'm like, this is my last chance, right? I say, does that count? They said, yeah. I said, I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what, what, we gonna, what you gonna do? You know, they over there celebrating, you know, the fans are all shocked. I'm like, look, first of all, I was only like one or two for 10 that game. And I'm like, all right, give me another opportunity. <laughs> no, no. I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, I can't do nothing now. As a matter of fact, what we could do, you know, we went to New York. We won the first game, which is why that wasn't a championship shot. Right? Because yeah. if we had lost in New York, that would have been a championship shot. Yeah. It was just a game winning shot. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? <laughs> <laughs> the championship was the next day. Oh, can I get a witness? Oh, you just had to, had to wait. Set up party plans a little longer. That's all. Party plans. We just have to skip the party for that night. Yeah, it's all good. You retired in 2000 and you pursued coaching. You started coaching for the uh, Phoenix Mercury. Like, how was that? Like, what made you decide that you wanted to be a coach? Because like you gotta, you aggressive and and and, and yeah. you gotta work hard and just hearing your story and so forth um, to transition in that. I think my attitude, they asked me, do I want to coach? And I think my attitude, I'm like, man, I don't know if I can handle it because I'm a little bit aggressive. But how it was, was it for you to to experience that and want to do that? I love coaching and um, I love teaching and I love motivating. Um, so I thought the WNBA was a, a a level that I wanted to coach on. And um, I didn't, I didn't really care for it that much because, you know, th the biggest problem was a lot of the women that were playing. Um, I had just been drilling them and it's busting the year before. Right. <laughs> it's just busting that ass a minute ago. <laughs> so for you to come to me and act like a prima donna when I was blowing by you and you still in the gym looking for me, Right. I, I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, I don't really work with you. So, <laughs> I wasn't, it wasn't really my level, but coaching in college mm -hmm. was, um, it, it is, is amazing because they're more receptive. And I had to remind myself that I wasn't Cynthia Cooper when I was 18, mm -hmm. when I was 17, when I was learning how to play. 
my coach sometimes had to break it down for me and have patience. And that uh, allows me to have patience with my, with my players that I'm teaching. Uh, but just don't come to prima donna with me, you know, cause, cause I'm, yeah, yeah. Don't do that. Cause I'm, I'm a beast. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like if you a head coach, it's like, nah, you can't really, you can't really try that with, with, with this, with this coach. And like, for me, that's like, like when I played for Isaiah Thomas in New York, like whenever we talked or he, he got to saying something about basketball or why I should do this or why I should do that, I was just, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, like this Zeke. Yep. So like, that's like, you know what I'm saying? Not only is he from Chicago like me, but like he's one of the top 50 players ever. Like that's for you. Like when you, you one of the goats of this. So when you speaking on this thing, like it should be all ears, eyes front listening because not only did I do this, I did this at the highest level, level as the like the elite player at that level, and like for years in a row, not just a little spark. Mm -hmm. Now I did this for a long time. For the whole time yeah. I was here, I was me. So you know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is is real. So for you to be a coach, a college coach, whatever kind of coach, like any player should be able to listen to that. I don't care what grade level male, female, like this is greatness is talking to you that did this at the highest level it could be done. You can learn something. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I think there are certain things that come into play. Um, one, yeah, they listen, but then they say, oh, but you're Cynthia Cooper, I can't do that. And I'm, I'm telling you, you can't. I'm showing you, I'm demonstrating for you. Uh, but not everybody has that level of confidence like you, like you guys that you see something, you hear something, and then you apply it, right? And, and not everybody has that. Um, I realize that, so I try to reach people where they are. You know, but so coaching in the WNBA wasn't really my thing. Coaching in college, I love, 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 love. And I think at the end of the day, what I would love to do, what I'm absolutely made for is coaching in the NBA. That's what's up. Because they have my mentality, they want to be great. Mm -hmm. They want to learn how to move. And by the way, I brought the Euro step, step here, not James Harden. <laughs> uh -huh. Let it be known. <laughs> I brought it here. Let it hey, be listen, known. Listen, man. listen, if nothing else, if it, look, I, I just sitting here talking to you, I know you can motivate because it's been different times throughout this conversation that I've been ready to go hoop and I ain't hooped it all no long. But just 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 by how you get me hyped the way you talk it, I've been like, yeah, no, nah, she could she could get she could get you going. So I played in the big three and, and Nancy Lieberman was my coach. And I played for some of the greatest coaches. I played for Larry Brown, Stan Van Gundy, Mike D'Antoni, uh, Eric Spolstra, uh, who else? Uh, Alvin Gentry, all of these guys. And like, Coach Lieberman was as prepared. She was as vigilant about winning. She wasn't playing. It wasn't a joke to her. She was serious business. She, she scouted. We got like, this is a big three. This ain't a real NBA organization. We were getting scout tapes and films. She was sending us uh, plays to break down and all of this stuff. She, we won the championship that we won in that. We won because we took it serious and we were more prepared than any other team. And I know that to right. a man because we were, we, we talked to our peers and asked us and we would be getting, like we would be getting on the plane to go back. And this is the morning after. She's sending us stuff either when we land and when we, and this is just her. She don't have a staff. She don't have assistants and this and that doing that. Like experiencing that in the big three with her, let me know that it doesn't matter. Anybody can coach anybody. It does like exactly. me and coach, me and coach women in the WNBA. Why would it be any different? Like if, you, gotta, exactly if, right. if you come from a mother, you've listened to a woman talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, That's right. And, yeah. and I will tell you this, you know, I, I, I get the mentality. Like I get what they want. Right. And, and the way I think, the way how to get to the rim, I see I see pathways to the basket or if you're a shooter, how to get open. I mean, all of those things I want to teach and I want to support a head coach, you know, support the head coach shouldn't always have to be the one motivating and teaching these kids and spending time doing that. I should get the kid ready for the head coach. Yeah. I should get the kid motivated <laughs> while he's sitting on the bench. So when the coach call on him, he ready. He has yeah. the right mentality. He's ready to go. That's my job as an assistant coach. And, and, and in practice, we're constantly working. We're constantly working. So when you're called on in the middle of the season, towards the end of the season, after that all-star game, at, at, during the playoffs, you ready. Yeah. You ready to go. And that's what I want to bring to, to the NBA. 
Um, it's no disrespect to anybody out there, but it's former players that have those jobs right now that don't possess the passion about it that you have. And I don't feel that they can motivate the way that I feel you could. And that's I obviously never call any names, but I but that's just what I, I've been around it and I've seen it up close and personal. And not everybody takes that same approach that you just spoke about and with the passion that you have for it either. I appreciate that. Yeah, I definitely want to see a woman coaching like uh it's time. It's it's it's, it's definitely time. Everything oh, is it's coming. Awesome. Becky Hammond going to be a head coach over. soon. <laughs> it all. And, and it, what's better than the GOAT? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like I, I look at you like I look at the Michael Jordans and everybody else. Like, you are one of the GOATs for not just women, but men's and everybody else. Like, Hall of Fame. Basketball, Hall period. Fame. Basketball, period. You can't t- talk was- about the history of it without I talking about. Love to see that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, there was a, a, a photo on, um, shoot, it was on Instagram, it was on Twitter, going around with uh, me, Jordan, and Kobe, and LeBron, and Melo. Oh, and, oh, I love that uh, photo. I love that photo. It was so, it was so funny, because when I read the comments, everybody was like, who's the chick? <laughs> who's the girl? <laughs> like, what is she doing there? <laughs> hey, that's hilarious. I see that photo, they said goats. I see that photo, that was a nice photo. To look back on it, that's yeah, an amazing photo to have. How do you feel like, I, I mean, I know you were you were there for the beginning, so I mean, just to hear the all the new new things put in place for the uh, by the WNBA with the with the with the pay scale raise and the different the different uh, living scenarios, how they get you know help with their kids and stuff now that was never in place. Like, how do you feel like how far they've come? I know it's still a whole whole lot of work to go a lot more work to be done, but how do you feel about the progress that's been made on that front as far as taking care of the, the, these women athletes? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the fact that the WNBA respects the players enough to incorporate and to continue to grow the pay scale and other amenities that they um, give to the, to the players and to make their lives better, to make them able to only focus on basketball when they're playing during, during their season is amazing. Um, the pay scale, awesome. I think it's going to continue to get better. I tell people all the time, when you look at the the NBA at age 25, you know, they weren't get, making the money that the NBA is making right now. So we, we've got to take things in not necessarily baby steps, but progressive steps yeah. and continue to get better and continue to move forward. And I think this was a huge step for, for the WNBA in continuing to grow. You, we, we bring the talent to the court and now let's bring the talent to the checkbook as well. Hey, listen, out oh, yeah, there. This, 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 what I like to ask. You know, we, you, like you said, you from Watts. You, I'm, I'm from, I'm from the South Side Wild Hunters in Chicago. We, Wild we ain't really, hunting. yeah, we ain't came from much. So, like, when you, when you got, was it? You probably had to do it when you was overseas. So, when you first started getting some decent money, what did you do to treat yourself? What did you do? as you look back on like, oh, I probably wouldn't have bought that if I, you know, when I got to my adult stage. But I, I, I did it back then because I wanted to treat myself one time. I remember buying this leather. Uh, so in the inside was like sheepskin or fur or whatever the heck was in that joint. <laughs> and outside it was leather. It was overseas. So I bought it in Italy. And let me tell y'all, you know, I'm as ghetto as they come, right? So I'm walking through the airport. It's hot as hell in the airport. I'm walking through the airport. Like, yo, whatever, man. I, I mess around. I got the custom there. Like, is that, you bought that in Italy? I said, yeah. Like, it was Spencer. I said, yeah. He said, well, you didn't write down on your customs form. Oh, man. That you purchased. I was I like, declaration right. joint. <laughs> I, didn't de- I didn't declare it. I had to pay taxes on that joint. Sure did. That's it was nice funny. Tip, but tip, yeah, I wouldn't have. leather. Yeah, man. Oh, it was so nice. I was touching <laughs> it. Yeah, man. This real stuff right here. <laughs> Let me ask you, not your top five, not your top five female women's players, but your your favorite five women's players of all. Oh, wow. Your favorite five, the ones that you like to look in and see or watch their careers and see, whether it's before or after you. So I wish that everyone had a chance to see Cheryl Miller actually play professional basketball because she was phenomenal. Um, so she would be one. Um, I, I love Maya Moore. I love her. She is a beast. Um, And she commanded the court. 
Diana Taurasi is one of the most fierce competitors and shooters and scorers that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and she just has a swag about her, you know? She has a swag that I want. I want her swag. I know I have some swag, right? I want hers too, <laughs> right? That's how much yeah. I, I respect her. And um, there are so many players. I mean, I, I got to go with my girls, Tina Thompson. Tina Thompson. So the thing I love about Tina is that she never stayed the same either, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. She was a three-point shooter and back to the basket. Before the end of her career, she had extended her range for three-pointers. She was taking you off the dribble. She was facing up on the block. So she, you can literally play her anywhere. All-time leading scorer. Like, she's doing her thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, she, she was just amazing. You know, and I and I, and I would put Cheryl Swoops in there as well. You know, playing against Cheryl Swoops and practicing against Cheryl Swoops, the fact that she plays both sides of the ball, cat quickness, knock down a three pointer, and that little spin dribble she does, that spin move off the off a fast break was just unstoppable. Like, who is your favorite men five men players? The, your favorite that you like to watch and that you you've been paying attention to over the years. So, um, love James Harden's game. Um, you know, he's just a bucket waiting to happen. Walking. You know, in fact, yeah, he is. I mean, he, the fact that he's a lefty helps him, you know, throw defenders off, um, off balance. But I'm going to tell you, the way he knocks down three-pointers are ridiculous. Um, I love Steph Curry. You know, the fact that it, with his size, he really has maximized, you know, his ability out there on the court to score in so many different ways. Um, Anthony, you know, when you, when you look at the whole combination of James and Anthony, I love that dynamic duel because um, they really play off of each other. And they remind me of me and Tina Thompson, for example, and, you know, the flexibility, you know, to, to knock down the open three that, that Tina has, Anthony has, you know. Um, and then LeBron getting to the rim, I'm more of a slasher than I am a shooter. So, you know, I love to see Bron Bron get to that rim and show him what's really going on, finishing around that rim. Um, but Kawhi is, is also a favorite of mine because the mid-range game is, is an underused, utilized tool, you know. So I could go, you know, throughout the NBA and, and just name players, but... Um, you know, it, it's the NBA has transformed as well from just a, you know, true um, position players. You know, the point guard is only the point guard. The wing is only the wing. The two and the three are the same. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, two more dynamic post players who can take you off the dribble and shoot the three. And they, they, they can just attack you in so many different ways. So um, I love it. Shoot. I love watching it. I love uh seeing what I'm going to see new, like, you know, what, what's going to happen that, that, I, that shakes my head today, you know, right. what they're going to do. Tell me this. How do you, how do you feel like in, in April, what is it? April 24th of, uh, of 2021 is going to be the WNBA's 25th anniversary. Like, like how, is that amazing to you that you like when this first happened, could, did you think it was going to last the stand the test of time? Like, uh, how do you feel about seeing it get here and with you being in the inaugural season, the first champion ever, and now it's 25 years later? Yeah. One, it dates me. Um, and two, I will tell you <laughs> that it feels great. I didn't know that the WNBA would make it because you, if you remember, there was a, a time where, some NBA teams moved away from some of the, the WNBA franchises and so, like the Comets, the Comets no longer exist. And so mm -hmm. they have some turbulent, some turbulent waters to, and, and situations to overcome. So I didn't know that we would see the WNBA in 25 years. So the fact that we've made it this far is the W is amazing. And you can, you know that the W is amazing because of the level of talent that you see out there every single year. Yeah. And every single year, somebody is jumping. So it wasn't like us. Like, they, we, we owned the WNBA. And then I retired. I had to give somebody else a chance to win a championship. Yeah. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I just, I love the talent. I love the enthusiasm. I love the activism. I love that, that they 
have a voice and they use their voice and then they go out on the court and perform. I'm all about performing because we need to win fan support. We need to continue to prove that we deserve to have a professional league in America. And you do that by showing up and showing out every day. You, you got inducted into the, to the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame in 2009, right? And um, that's an amazing compliment. Ten. The Hall of Fame, not the women. No, no. Oh, no, the women's I'm, in I'm 2009. About, I'm talking yeah. about the women's in right. 2009, but then to get inducted into the Naismith, and become the first WNBA player to ever do it. How how mind blowing and how crazy was that for that to happen back to back years? No, it was. I was, I was just in awe. It was such an incredible honor for me, and and here's why. Right, the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame was great because, you know, I was the I, I was. I live to be, to make my mark and to leave my mark on women's basketball. Um, and, and so it was phenomenal. My family was there. They got a chance, you know, my kids were really young. So they got a chance to see, you know, what mommy was all about them and everyone, you know, kind of party and rally around mommy, right? The Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame was on another level in another realm for me. Um, and because now, I'm among the greatest basketball players in the history of the game. Period. And, and I will tell you that I didn't think I would make it. And the reason I didn't think I would make it is because the, the U United States of America only got a chance to see me for four years. They really only just touched. And, and once again, I was a 34 year old rookie. Like, can you imagine me at 27? Right. In the WNBA, like, come on, man. That's why I said from the you, beginning, them four straight was crazy that you did it from 34. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I didn't think that, that I had done, I didn't know, I, I, let me say this. I didn't know that I had done enough and made a big enough impression to be inducted into the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. But let me tell you, you don't dream of being a Hall of Famer because it's too big, Right. it's too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's too much. It overwhelms you, right? But when you get the call, you're talking about everything being worth it and leaving a legacy and all of the sacrifices, and all of the practices and sprints and injuries, go play and guys telling me I couldn't play and then they 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 allowing me to play. The, the girls telling me this or that or this. and and you overcome all of that. A kid from Watts. Lock High School is in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. Straight up. Come on, man. And you got the and you got the asterisk by you because you're the first of somebody to ever do this. You're the first WNBA player to ever do it. So it's a little more special. Cause like you said, that first championship, it could only be with the one first. That's it. Like we yeah. won the first championship of the new millennium. I'm gonna just throw that out there. 2000. There you go. Go. <laughs> Yeah. That's a lot of first there. That's a whole lot of whole lot of yeah. me. So I was, I, I felt, I felt just, it was super special. I was so honored to represent the WNBA for the first time in, in the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. I didn't think I would make it, but I was overjoyed that I did. Wow. You, you, you the GOAT. You, you definitely is. And that, like I say, it's Now a can a sister get a video game though? Can, a, can can we get number 14 comments, you know, uh through the hey, 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 Ronnie 2K, NBA Live. We need, we need, we need Cynthia, we need CC in the game, man. We need in the oh, game. Man. This is greatness. Get up my team card or something. They got the new stuff now. They got the new stuff now, CC, where they you could be, you could play with Bill Russell and Derrick Rose on the same team. Now they gotta get you in there where they could, you know, just look, switch, swap it out. Come on, Ronnie 2K, get, get it cracking, get it cracking. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> All right, man, this, is, this, this has been unbelievable. We appreciate you gracing us with your presence. This is greatness in the building. Thanks. One of the all time greats, regardless of sport, of, of, of male, female. This is one of the goats of the hoop game. We got, Cynthia, raise the roof in the building. Cooper, we yeah. appreciate you. Yeah, here we, here we knucklehead. We appreciate you. Thank you yeah. so much.
CC. We appreciate it. It was great being here. Thanks for having me. Yo, we heard about the forthcoming article you got coming out with the Players Tribune. We'll be looking forward to that. Everybody check it out when it come out. Thank you.